Hey, everybody. You know, one of the things my very first mentor taught me was that if you want to be successful in this business or in any business, you got to learn how to negotiate. That's why this Wednesday at seven o'clock, we're having a webinar called The Art of Negotiating in the Arts. Seven o'clock Eastern time. Check out www.theproducersperspective.com for all the info. Now on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hey everybody, Ken Davenport here. Time for another episode of the Producers Perspective podcast. Today I'm very excited to say we have one of the most celebrated lighting designers in our industry. Please welcome to the podcast six-time Tony Award winner Natasha Katz. Welcome Natasha. Thank you, Ken. So Natasha has designed over 50 Broadway shows, from School of Rock to Long Day's Journey and Tonight, from Once to Cats and even Mike Tyson's show. She's also designed extensively for Disney, including Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, Aida, Aladdin, Tarzan, and a ton of others. She's also the first Broadway lighting designer I ever met. Do you remember this? No, I don't remember that. So I was a PA on My Fair Lady in 1993. I remember that. And for some reason, I remember this meal we had at like an Orlando tourist trap with Craig Jacob. Wow. And I'll never forget it because it was the first time someone I heard someone talk about lighting in a way that I understood. Uh, and also because you were just very nice. So, <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> obviously, and My Fair Lady was not an easy experience, was it? No, it was very, we were cursed, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, starting with all the... Uh, there was a thunderstorm when they loaded out of Fort Myers into the out of the first city that we tried out, and all the trucks got completely submerged in water. There was a local stagehand like rumblings of a strike, almost a walkout. Oh, there God, was, yeah. We had Melissa Erico had a vocal cord hemorrhage. I mean, there was <laughs> yes, it was a curse. Yes, it, it was, was. That was back in 1993. It must have been a baby oh, when you God. were designing. But how did you get started with lighting design? Well, I. I grew up in New York City, and I think that I was mostly interested in the theater. And I think that I was born wanting to, in, in my mother's womb, all I wanted to do was work in the, in the theater. And, and on Broadway, really, because of, because of growing up in New York. So my parents took me to the theater all the time. But all I did was go to the theater. So my senior year, my present for graduating high school was eight Broadway shows in one week. It was a great week. It was really fantastic. Then I went to Oberlin College, and I knew I had no idea what, what I wanted to do in the theater, but I, I knew I wanted to do something. So I started at Oberlin College. I was there for a year. I tried all sorts of different things. And then they had an internship program where you could get a full semester's credit to work with somebody in anywhere. If I wanted to be a biochemist, I could work in biochemistry. So I, I just started doing a little bit of lighting at Oberlin. And I had an, so I had an internship with Roger Morgan, who was, is, it's not was. Well, he doesn't do lighting anymore. He's an architectural consultant, theater consultant. But he, at the time, I remember Mama was trying out in Philadelphia and then opening on Broadway with Lee Volman, Richard Rogers' last musical, and at the Majestic Theater, believe it or not, there was a show before Phantom. <laughs> And I was able to see the process. David Mitchell designed the scenery. And I saw the process from really from the very beginning, from the design part, through Philadelphia, through the opening in New York City. And um, it, a lot of people were fired on the show. So it was a show in trouble, which actually, when you think about me in college, that was really interesting to see all of that. Because when you see a show, at least for me, when I was younger, it never occurred to me that those things could happen. Like, so, like me and Mark Hurley? Yeah, exactly. We talked about two shows in trouble already. And then after that, what happened was I met so many people that I started getting a lot of work. And I started working with a lot of other Broadway lighting designers. I worked with Ken Billington and Jules Fisher. And I must be leaving somebody out. Roger Morgan, David Siegel. And so after that, I it was kind of on the job training for me, really, I I just continued to work. And then, well, shall, shall I tell you one little story? I, unless you want to ask a question. No, story of what it's all about. Yeah, I do have one little story. No one's listening, I promise. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I feel, okay. It's a story I've told before, but I, so when I was working with Roger, he, then I ended up working for Roger. 
in his consulting firm and as an assistant to him. And I did a number of shows with him as his assistant. And then he couldn't do a show out of the Ohio Theater in Cleveland, Ohio. So I, he offered the job to me, which was incredibly generous of him because I think that I must have been 23 at the time. And the director and I, Clifford Williams, who's no longer with us, he's, he's amazing. And we did a child's Christmas in Wales. It was very difficult for me because I was so young and he was, Clifford had been in the business for so long. So it was difficult. But then at the end, we sort of came together, Clifford and I. It, was, it ended up being a great experience. And I went back and did it again the next year. So I guess it was about 24. I got a letter, a letter, believe it or not. And the, person who wrote the letter, it was from Arthur Cantor, producer, where he produced a lot of shows, and the letter, the type letter, the letter A, didn't work, so it said, Der Ubinu, <laughs> I'm interested if you'd like to do a <laughs> show, and I finally figured out, he wanted me to light a Broadway show, and I thought it was a joke, quite honestly, and then I got in touch with Arthur, and I met my first Broadway show, Pack of Lies, with Rosemary Harris. And why lighting? If you were just so interested in the theater, and but you were something drew you to it, why did you choose this as your contribution to the theater that you love so much? You know, that's a really good question. That's a really good question after that story I just told in the sense that it all seemed to come so naturally. But I just sort of, as I said, I've kind of dabbled in everything. I'm not somebody who was born wanting to be a lighting designer. I'm not somebody who did it in high school, I figured out for myself that I just wanted to concentrate in certain areas until I kind of found what I wanted to do. I thought it would be actually producing or maybe directing, but so I did some lighting at Oberlin and then I did this internship and the minute I started, the minute I started with Roger, I knew that it's what I wanted to do because it satisfied so many different things. It satisfied the artistic side of me. It definitely, I didn't realize how collaborative the theater was, you know, when I was younger. So it satisfied a whole kind of friend group and collaboration and supporting each other. And it also, it satisfied working in the theater. And I worked on Broadway when I was so young that it satisfied a dream of mine very, very quick. So tell me about your process for lighting a show. So you decide to do a show. Or actually, let's go back with that. What makes you decide to do a show? Someone like me calls you up and says, hey, I've got a new musical. It's called Coffee Cup the Musical. <laughs> and what's the first step? How do you make a decision? Because being a nailist designer like yourself, I'm sure people are asking you to do stuff all the time. What makes you decide one show or the other? Was that just a job offer for Coffee Cup the Musical? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, great. You know, I love working. So I... There's something in most jobs that would be interesting to me, but I I love to work with people I've worked with before as I've gotten older. I take I take shows. It's rare that I'll sometimes I'll turn a show down because I really really don't like it. But I I take shows based on who's asking me to do it, who the, who's on the creative team, if their past experiences with people, and if I also if I accept a job and then am offered another one at the same time. I always say the job that I was offered first. So I guess that's the way to put it. It's not that picky and choosy, actually. So let's say I offer you coffee cup or, I don't know, once in this island, hypothetically. What's the first step in your process for designing and when does that start for you? When do you like to start the work? Well, the best way, no question, is to be a part of the process early on. But that doesn't happen on every show. Every show is different. Sometimes I'm brought in after the set is completely designed and the director and the set designer have had long talks along with the other the rest of the creative team. The best is definitely to, to come on early. So that's what I like to do. And do you start looking at the script? Do you like to see it? What Where does the work of like, oh, here's where the colors go. What's, what is that? Like, how do you, do you go home to your office? Do you sit with it? Do you like to look? A lot, a lot, so my process is definitely, well, to read the script first. And then I read the script without thinking about lighting at all, just to get a real sense of how I feel about it. It really, I mean, I think for me, certainly the creative process is so difficult to describe in any field. 
So it does have to come from the heart in a way. So I don't, if I'm looking at it from a lighting point of view, then I'm really not getting a sense of what the story is about and the storytelling. So the, my first read is just as your average audience member. And then soon after that, usually we start having discussions. The set designer and the director, if I'm born in early. <laughs> so... I actually let me back up a second because then I'll read it again and then I'll start to underline things that have to do with light or my feelings about it or my feelings about a character's relationship to the light or uh, the scene. Very often the script says nothing about lighting at all or what time of day it is, so then I might start writing questions in the script. Or if it does say what time of day it is, then I start to think about, okay, why did the playwright say that it's morning? It must have something to do with either telling a linear story, uh, not even a linear story, but something that has to do with time of day. Or it's the playwright just wrote it and there's some sort of instinct involved. So then I try to just kind of figure out why is it morning, then how the characters relate to that, and things like that start to swim around my head. So it's really just kind of swimming in light in a way in the relationship of that to the story. And then sometimes it's the set designer that I'll speak to first. And once the set starts to form itself, it so informs what the lighting is because the lights cannot exist on their own if there's a, if there's a set, and that starts to sort of tell tell the tale of what the lights are what the lights are going to be, where the, where we're going to hang them, which is also another huge part of the process, which is trying to find real estate, and especially in New York, real estate being hard to find. Finding the real estate on the stage for so that I, I can actually light the show. So there, I might have a conversation with a set designer that is something like uh, they, they might have a brick back wall, which is done a lot for sure. And we might have a conversation like, well, is the wall something that is going to show time of day? So we're going to splash, kind of break up warm light across it and then cool light for nighttime or is it abstract where the lighting has nothing to do with time of day but more about emotion or we might talk about how much of the scenery do you really want lit or should it kind of fall into shadow and very often a lot of those questions can't be answered until we get into the theater but the dialogue begins or the set designer says to me oh this is based on you know an 1890 photo that I found and take a look at this it's kind of sepia colored so that also might inform something. Or I might find a photograph of something that I bring to the set designer. But it's usually, for me, their influence on me, for sure. I do I do see myself as a chameleon in the business, being able to... I, I think it is my job to kind of, kind of get everybody else's kind of point of view and then start to see how I can kind of wrap all that together. And in, in the middle of that is somewhere my point of view. Sometimes it's indescribable, sometimes it's describable. But it starts, for me, with really bringing the rest of the... Because there are costumes that are a certain color. There's a set that's a certain color. There's a director who wants certain things. There's props that are a certain size and shape and all of those things. And it's light that actually defines all of that. And it's light that, in many ways, pulls that all together and starts to kind of help the storytelling. I really think that's the best way to put it. Yeah, and I can see now why you've been so successful, not only because of just your the talent of physically designing the light, but the collaborative nature of what you do. In a way, I'm, I'm starting to think of a lighting designer like a book writer of a musical in that it's tying all the elements and providing the fabric, enhancing everything, but you often don't get all the credit for what, for what <laughs> the beauty that is on stage because people don't think about the light. Like they see a costume or they see a physical set piece, right? Because they can't touch the light. Yeah. That way. No, I think that that really is true. One of the well, one of the things I also love about the theater is that we only exist at the moment, and then we whatever, however long the show runs, then the set gets taken away. And some new show goes into the same theater where we just were. So we just we exist. We exist as an art form in the present for the audience, which I actually love that idea. And then we kind of disappear and we become part of their memories. We are brigadoon. 
Yes, we are. I'll come back in a hundred years. <laughs> so my dad was a, a doctor, and growing up, I remember like going into his office one day, and he was like studying so hard, and I was like, "Why? What are you doing? You're a doctor already. Why do you need to?" He's like, "Well, son, I was like seven. I need to keep up on all the latest procedures and the technological advances in what I do in order to stay at the top of my field." I think of that way. For lighting design, I mean, the technology changes that you've seen over the last 20, 30 years, I imagine, are mammoth. How is how has that affected what you do today from when you started? Well, I like being acquainted with the doctor. <laughs> You're very surgical with those lights. It's very <laughs> precise. Yeah. Oh, my God. Lighting has changed so much since I started, and it continues to change. I mean, it's changing at a rapid pace rapid pace right now and with the invent of the internet it's you know we used to have catalogs and catalogs and catalogs in our offices but those days are over so to keep up with all the technology you have to really it's it's kind of a side job to being a lighting designer it's really important i think to keep up with all of it but oh my god so much has changed computer boards were well, they had been around when i started and but the biggest change was the uh, was moving lights i think how long ago that is, maybe 20, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, where you don't have to get on a ladder and have four stagehands at the bottom of the ladder, change the gel, and then the next day the director says, I wish that light was two feet more stage left. Now you, there's somebody's behind a board and they just twirl a little button. I mean, it really is kind of a miracle. Every time every time I'm in the theater room working with moving lights, which is most of the time, I think, oh my God, this is truly a miracle. And then let's see, and then now LEDs are a huge part of lighting, which means that lights can be smaller and much less heat. They don't cost the producers as much money, which is a good thing. You don't have to change the bulbs often. And, uh, oh, there's just, there's so, so, so much a change. I mean, we can take out our iPhones now and look at the list of cues while we're in the theater if we want to. It's really miraculous. And I think that I actually do believe that, Lighting has gotten, I don't want to say better, but I think that you, there is more precision to it than there used to be because you can, but you weren't able to before. But it's got its pluses and minuses because things are so precise. Well, I think maybe 50 years ago, things, lighting was much broader. But if a lighting designer is how to use the tools, then thumbs up. If a moving light was a miracle when it came out and still somewhat miraculous, what's the miracle you think will will impact the lighting industry in the next 10 to 20 years? Oh, it's a tough question. I get that question a lot. And you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, somehow I don't think that way. I don't know what, what it, the future brings. What do you think about projections? Oh, projections. Well, projections, I love projections. If used to tell the story to make sure as long as we're not living in a film on stage. And to me, I think the best use of projection, just from a kind of overall point of view in the theater, is that when it melds with everything, when lighting and projection is melding together, you can't tell the difference. And there's a kind of depth to that that's, I think, really important because projection can be such a two-dimensional tool. And once it starts melding with lighting and scenery and costumes, it, it starts to feel more more real, like there's humanity to it, if that's what you're trying to do. I mean, certain, a lot of the times, projection is used as kind of a, a way to distance an audience and make it be something futuristic or one of issues like that. But I'm all for projections, and that may be the future, actually. And in the funny way, projection lighting is the same thing on some levels, because we, you know, we put in gobos, which breaks up the light, and it can be a window or a, a leaf or a coffee cup so lighting can kind of do that so we still kind of do the same thing which is projection can be written out as video projection so it can all be in motion do you think the audience expectation of lighting has changed for example the first show you did on broadway your first show, how many lights did it have do you remember Oh, I don't, but definitely, I don't remember. And your current, like your last musical, do you remember how many instruments that had? Well, the first show I did was a play, so it was, plays and musicals are so different, but I would say that musicals do very often have more lights now than they used to. Is I, that because of the audience, audience's need, or why do you think that is? 
I, you know, so it's a really good question. Has the audience's need for a kind of writing from today versus 30, 40 years ago changed? I know that's what you're asking. And I, I guess it really has. You know, people tell me that it has all the time, that they expect, well, I really want to ask you. I know that it, we're not interviewing you, but what do you think is the difference about what an audience wants? I, I do think that an audience now, their short-term memory, just physiologically, I think, we're so used to being inundated by our senses inundated that I, I think there is a... I, my mind needs to be constantly awakened by changing images in a way. I think they're used to changing images on television now more than they ever were. So to show them something that doesn't change as often or different perspective, I, especially in a theater where they're trapped in a seat and can't move, I think they dull easier than they used to. Yeah, that's way. interesting. Because that is where lighting, I mean, that's where lighting can lighting can actually do what you're talking about. Wake people up. Are, yeah, definitely. I mean, we can, ch- we, we can definitely change your perspective of what you're looking at in a moment's notice. In a, in a zero count, we can go from red to blue. Here's one of my James Lipton questions. If the Smithsonian Institute called you and said, we have room in the Institute for one of your numbers, one of the moments in the theater that you've lit be preserved here forever, what would you choose? Do you, do you have a favorite of like, oh, wow, that that's it. I got it right there. I, an image came to me immediately, actually. I can't believe it. Because when people say, what's your favorite show you ever did? You know, that it's, it's an unanswerable question. But Aida, Aida, what, I can think of two or three places in Aida. If they could just allow two or three at the Smithsonian. But we did a song called... Uh, another pyramid, which has a gazillion light cues in it, and literally the stage manager was go 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 the whole time. See, that's something that changed. You can actually have the stage manager say one go now, and then the rest of the light cues can all happen on their own. You couldn't do that when we maybe you could have. But I'm not a great supporter of that. I like the human element. And then Heather Hadley singing "Easy as Life." That I I'd like to see something to have. <laughs> What did Broadway producers not understand about lighting that you wish they did? Or I have to phrase this in this way. If you could get all of us in a room, what would be the one thing you'd say? I There are a couple things. One is certainly the number of moving lights on a show is very often I need more than is in the budget. And moving lights are expensive, unfortunately. So... Because moving lights can really pinpoint, as we were talking about earlier, can pinpoint so many things. And then here's an example. You have a little Elvis Presley doll on your table. So you might want to put two lights on Elvis Presley. And now you as a producer had said to me just earlier how the audience has changed and the light is changing a lot. So I might put two lights on Elvis And then I want the floor to be a color around Elvis. And then I want so that Elvis looks good. And then in about five minutes when the song starts, you as a producer might want 20 lights on Elvis flashing because of what we just talked about, the audience. And I may have like eight of them. So that's one thing is (laughs) that I wish that I wish there was a way to explain beforehand to a producer why we need uh, as many lights as we do or the kind of light that we do because the quieter lights are more expensive than the lights that have a lot of fans in them so if we get the quieter ones and we get less of them so it's things like that that it's hard to explain before the show before we start teching the show then when we start teching the show it sometimes producer might start to understand, and many producers do understand this, there are plenty that do, that, oh my God, if Natasha only had four more lights, this number would be what it needs to be, it might be the best way to explain that. And then the other thing is that sometimes I'm not sure the producer understands that when we walk into the theater, it we've done all this work beforehand, we've hung the lights, we've had all these conversations, that we are the only people who are starting from zero scratch, empty blank page. We have to write every single light cue. We have to write Q1, Q2. So the set designer, it's all been done before. The costume designer, it's all been done before. We come in and 
time is money, so the clock's ticking. And so sometimes I think the user doesn't really understand that. You've done a lot of work for Disney. Do you find there, is there a different experience working for a corporate producer like Disney as opposed to an independent like myself? Bottom line, no, because there, Tom Schumacher is the head of Disney Theatrical, and he's like you and me. I mean, he's, he's a great producer. He's great to work with, extremely supportive. So from that point of view, no, there's, there's no difference at all. And he's engaged, and he's there, and he's, he's really wonderful to work for. The difference would be that they have a big support system that I think as an independent producer, you don't have the same support system. So one or the other isn't better, by the way. <laughs> okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin who you know very well, comes to your office and knocks on the door and says, Natasha, I want to thank you for lighting me so beautifully and lighting so many shows and your incredible contributions to the industry by granting you one wish. You're such a nice person. I knew this back in the early 90s when we were at that restaurant. What makes you really mad about this industry? What makes you bang on the table, bang on your light board, throw something around the room that you'd ask this genie to change with a snap of a finger? One thing about Broadway or the business that you'd change. I don't know. I'm having such a love affair with it right now that I don't know if I want to change it. Because that would lead to... No. Is there one thing I'd like to change? I'm really quite happy right now, Ken. Do I have to change something? No, you don't have to change a thing. No, I'm very, very happy. Yeah, no, there is no, there's nothing that I want to change. Good. I, well, I guess I just want to keep working on shows that I love. But there you have it, the happiest lighting designer on the planet. <laughs> I guess so. Well, thank you so much for that, and, do, and thank you so much for your contribution to the theater and for being so happy. Positivity is a very difficult thing in this industry because it uh, can be challenging at times. So I, I find that unbelievably admirable. So thank you for that. Thanks to all of you for listening. Again, thanks to you for being nice to me in 1993. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Don't forget, learn the ins and outs of successful negotiating tactics this Wednesday on our webinar at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. Check out theproducersperspective.com for more info. Oh.